Hi, good afternoon and welcome to 24 by 7 Magazine's webinar, Electrical Safety Testing Plan Preventive Maintenance, sponsored by Rigel Medical. I'm Carrie Forsythe-Stevens, the editor of 24 by 7 Magazine and your host. I'm here with two excellent speakers, Jack Barrett, who is Rigel Medical's National Business Development Manager, who boasts 40 years of experience providing consultative solutions for engineering and medical needs, and Rebecca Adkins, an Army-trained biomed and CDET with more than 20 years of experience in the field. After the presentation, the two speakers will answer as many questions as they can live. So throughout the webinar, submit your electrical safety-related questions via the Q&A box on your screen. Also, the complete slide deck is available for PDF download. Refer to the box on the right-hand side of your screen that says Slide Deck for Download and click on the link anytime during the webinar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to the first speaker, Jack Barrett. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate you and certainly the rest of the 24 by 7 team, a number of which are on the phone with us this afternoon or morning or evening, depending as to what time zone our participants are in. Great being here with you all this afternoon, and we have a, a, a great number attending our presentation. It, we would be remiss if we did not uh, give a big thank you to all of the biomedical engineers, clinical engineers, technicians during the HTM week. You really are the, the watchdogs of patient safety, and we talk about patient safety quite a bit during the course of a presentation, but it really extends beyond patient safety. We also have the clinical operator safety that is in touch with the same equipment. So it's really a number of folks that come into play when we talk about electrical safety from nurses to technicians to the patients themselves. But uh, patients are probably a bit more critical on electrical safety because they're not always in the best shape when they're laying in that, that hospital bed. So, again, thank you to all of you for what you do. Conversation for this afternoon obviously revolves around electrical safety, preventative maintenance, and really planned preventative maintenance. We're going to timeshare the presentation. I'm going to speak for a bit, and then Rebecca Atkins is going to, uh, to do a number of the slides as well who is our um, biomedical engineer based in Texas. So we're going to go through the, the scope of the presentation, which I guess I'm doing right now. A little bit of background on electrical safety, where it all started from. We're going to go into standards and classifications. And the interesting thing here is really it's a moving target. There are a number of, of different test protocols, IEC 6601, IEC 62353, local variants of them, such as the AMI 6601 standard, the NFPA 99 standard, which is, is very, very popular and used quite often in the United States. Um, but it is a bit of moving target because there's always changes to these test protocols, hopefully going a little easier and simpler, but not always the case. We're going to talk a bit about um, how to test, some considerations thereof, and then uh, do a summary and closing comments and any questions that you folks have that hopefully we could uh, give you outstanding answers for. So scope of presentation, here we go. So as I said, we're going to talk about the various test criteria, the different test protocols, 6601, 62, 353, et cetera. But by all means, this is not a directive as to what you should be doing within your hospital or facility. Each hospital, each facility has their own standard practice, their own standard process that you need to follow and be respectful of. So the course of the presentation, we'll, we'll talk about different things. Um, probably one of the best ones is testing patient leads. That's a, a huge variable for a number of different organizations, whether they do it or not do it how they do it, et cetera. So we're going to go through the standard, and we'll speak to how the standard says to do it. Um, but again, whatever the, uh, the hospital standard process is, that is uh, what you folks are following. So 
So for a background, let's take a look at the development process to begin with for a medical product. And we start off here with R&D, but truly the process begins before that with gaining customer input, uh, marketing folks coming up with a product specification, the hashing around of that with engineering, and then the, uh, the engineers go to work for development and into qualification. And this could be on, depending on the type of product, it may involve FDA 510K approvals. But once it shows up at the, uh, the doorstep of your facility, you're really the, the manager in charge of that piece of equipment throughout its life until you get to decommissioning. Yes, there might be firmware upgrades, there might be recalls, but um, again, you're the folks that are dealing with all of that. Why safety testing? Without any doubt, without any exaggeration, it is the most common test that a biomed does during the course of, of their day. And the true objective is to determine if that piece of product is electrically safe to be used in the patient environment. And it's also kind of watching for not just how it tests today, but also what the, uh, the history has been, whether the, uh, the numbers are moving and making sound decisions as to, well, you know, maybe I, I should go through a calibration on this because it just it, it seems to be changing over time. So back in the 70s, there was a great deal of attention to what's called a microshock hazard. And this really was non-functional current, leakage current, if you will, that could have a, a tendency to harm the patient. And by harming the patient, we really talk about the muscle being the most, or the heart muscle being the most important organ. And if there is enough current, the heart itself can go into fibrillation, which means it's starting to flutter, not being very efficient, effective at pumping blood and oxygen through the blood stream and through the patient. And that is the, uh, the real core reason why we do electrical safety testing in the medical field. All about patient and operator safety. 1971, this uh, political activist that you still hear about every now and then, Ralph Nader, a uh, Connecticut resident, which is uh, my home state as well, had a relative who was in the hospital, and as he was visiting that relative, kind of looked around at the condition of uh, certain things within the patient room, and more critically within the patient environment, which is an envelope of, of certain distances, side to side, front to back, and above the patient. And he determined with the studies that he did that over a thousand people a year were being electrocuted while they're supposedly in this uh, safe hospital environment. So he published this article in the, uh, the Ladies Home Journal back in 1971, and that, uh, that kind of proved as a kickstart for a lot of what we do today as far as electrical safety testing. A little uh, tangent on uh, Mr. Nader. He also got involved with, uh, with other activities as well, such as a, uh, a certain vehicle that was manufactured by Chevrolet. Uh, his uh, study on that was called Unsafe at Any Speed, and it took a, a car that was pretty popular at the time, the Chevrolet Corvair, and uh, pretty much moved that car, that automobile, into obsolescence. So preventative maintenance, again, plan preventative maintenance, quite really. The task is to find things that could be wrong either right now with the testing that you're doing or what you think might be happening within the unit. All starts off with the visual inspection, which is uh, where a number of, of issues are found. But then we do ground continuity, ground bond testing, insulation testing, leakage currents, non-functional currents really, on 
And then, of course, depending on the type of device that you're using, it may have some performance testing associated to it as well. And then data, data capture and management, whether you're capturing data manually, writing it on a test report or on a sticker that goes on the side of the unit, or if you're doing some electronic saving of that data file for traceability and management, those are all variables, and those variables change from hospital to hospital, from facility to facility. No surprise, to have current flow, you must have a path for current to flow, and uh, hopefully that path does not involve the, uh, the patient themselves. It will follow the path of least resistance, so later on when Becky's speaking, we'll talk about doing some, some ground continuity testing, and if there is another ground path, you could very easily measure zero ohms, which is uh, a bit suspect because the current is flowing through a device rather than the 1K resistor for the body model within the safety analyzer itself. So there are functional currents, non-functional currents, good currents and bad currents, if you will. Uh, good currents can be a lifesaver. That's electrical currents give us our EKG signals, our EEG signals. We use it in electrosurgery generators. We use it in defibrillators, so if the heart is fluttery, we can zap it, zap the heart with uh, six amps or so. But that, of course, is measured in joules of energy and put it back into a, a normal rhythm, nor the normal sinus rhythm. But then there is this, uh, this leakage current that um, could be a danger to the patient, and we need to make sure that current is uh, at pretty minimal levels. So we say minimal levels. There's a couple of sites that you can uh, Google and they'll pop up, and some of them might suggest that anything below one milliamp is a safe current for leakage current, if you will. But the tests that we do on are at much lower values. We're measuring microamps, uh, 100 microamps in a normal operating condition, 500 microamps in a single fault condition. And it first time I saw this chart, quite frankly, it, it was amazing to me because you know, being a, an electrical engineering guy, you always find yourself um, getting shocked a little bit. And just how how little current it takes to start to cause problems within a human. And again, you think about the, the person laying in that bed, they're not in the best of health, so they, they are a bit more susceptible to challenges and dangers coming from this leakage current. If you ever attended one of the uh, the sessions that we do on ESU testing, this slide uh, will probably look very, very familiar to you. But what it does highlight is our line frequency here in the States, North America, is 60 hertz. And that is a, a very, very dangerous current to the, the human body. The reason for that is our muscles can respond to that frequency. So if you can come in contact with a live wire, your muscles will contract. Um, you'll grab onto that wire. You won't be able to let go. Electricians have a, a phrase for that, you know, bonded to the wire. Um, and left there for too long, you're facing electrocution, which, again, is, is a problem with the heart muscle going into fibrillation. So... The frequency is dangerous, dangerous to us at low levels, low frequencies. When you uh, start to look at the frequency spectrum, you'll get up to, oh, 100 hertz, maybe 120 hertz, up to 200 hertz. And that's where uh, physical therapists with their electrical stim machines will um, exercise muscles and cause the, uh, the muscles to twitch to, uh, to exercise the patient. And then you uh, continue on up that spectrum, you'll get into the area of Oh, 400, 450 kilohertz and above, and you'll start to run into the ESU generators themselves. Most of them operate between 450, 500 kilohertz today, but uh, newer models, lower power units are, uh, are operating up at the, the one megahertz range. So leakage current, I touched on this a little bit. Uh, current that is not functional, the bad current, if you will. Leakage current is, is called different things to, to different folks in different places as well. And, and 
Rebecca will dive into that a little bit. It's always going to be there. Uh, anytime you measure zero leakage current, you kind of raise an eyebrow. It is just a result of capacitance, resistance, and, and even inductance as part of the circuitry. And if not controlled by the specifications of IEC 6601 or the Amy equivalent of that, uh, they can get to the point where they can be harmful to the patient. So that's why we have limits um, and we test to be sure that the products are within those limits. IEC 6601 is, is kind of the governing factor for manufacturing process for the medical equipment. And then once that product, that piece of medical equipment gets into the field, into the facility, there are other options for, uh, for testing protocols. Standards and classifications. I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Rebecca at this point, and uh, I'll be back with you in a little bit. Hi, uh, my name is Becky, and as you heard from the introductions, I'm a biomed myself. So I'd like to take a minute to congratulate all my colleagues out there for, you know, this is our week. This is the, what we're going to do. This is showing us our praise. Um, I know a lot of you out there work for hospitals and companies, so I hope whatever you're doing for a physician at the moment, they do something extra special for you. Uh, I know a lot of you are laughing right now because uh, Nurses Week usually does get a lot more than what we get. But uh, my manager is Jack, so hopefully while he's on the line, um, I can have him commit to me expensing a steak dinner for my congratulations. Ah, silence. I was oh, muted. I was done. muted, so I, I wasn't able to answer right away. But let's let's see how the presentation goes, and then uh, we'll talk about it. How's that? Oh, okay. Well, first we're going to start and talk out. Of, uh, we're going to go over three uh, different standards. Um, as you go around, around the globe, there's going to be tons of different standards. So even if you get your dream job in Australia, you're more than likely going to have to learn another standard. Uh, the three we're going to go over today are 60601, IEC 62353, and what we use here in America. Uh, even though if you don't know you're using it, more than likely you are using the standards for NFAP 99. First, we're going to go over... Oh, they rearranged the slides on me. Uh, this is what I was talking about, about our dream job in Australia. Um, you can see the differences that we're having right there. Uh, you can see the different numbers. And, of course, there's where we have the NFAP 99, and that is what we're using mostly in America, in hospitals and uh, service facilities. And if you own your own small ISO, this is probably what you're using also. First, uh, we're going to talk about uh, different things in 60601. Um, this is usually mostly a UK standard, uh, but you will, if you're flipping through a service manual in the United States, you might come across this. Um, I have had technical support questions call me. Um, they're flipping through the service manual, and they see the 60601, and they see a totally different limit, and they're kind of freaking out. Um, this is the part, we'll get to it later on in testing, and we'll show you the differences. But this is more than likely where you'll see 60601. But we're just going to give you some terms today so you won't be totally out in the field and totally lost. This will give you some highlight of what is going to go on. Uh, first, we're going to just talk about some classifications. First, we're going to talk about Class 1 equipment. Uh, this is basically anything with a grounding pin or it's a grounding wire, it can be fixed or it can be portable. And these are just all different classifications that you'll see in 60601. Class two equipment, um, this is usually, it's double insulated. Uh, it'll have a symbol. It usually, uh, it'll have a plastic enclosure. And more than likely, it'll have two prongs on it, but I have seen ones with three prongs on them. Um, so it is an anomaly. You will see it out there in the field. Uh, what it's designed to do is if the live wire does come off, it's designed so if the live wire does come off, it won't hit the case and make the case conductive. And that's what they're talking about when they're talking about double inflated equipment. And again, this is class two equipment. You'll see this again when we're talking later on in FAP 99. 
They're going to do a couple symbols for this. Um, if you notice across the top, it says ILMI. Um, people are probably wondering what that stands for. That's just the definition of medical electronic equipment. So when you see that in 60601, you'll know ILMI is medical electronics. Uh, the little symbols here, we're familiar, all familiar with the little ground symbol, and that would be for class one equipment. And if you see the little square and square, that's for class two, and that will indicate double insulated equipment. Some more terminology and designs that you'll probably only see in 60601. Um, you'll see these little guys, and they'll refer to body type. We'll see this later on again when we start talking about different tests and how we're going to be testing. And then you see the little guy in the square. That will be body floating. And then you'll see the heart inside the square, and that will be cardiac floating. And here's some examples of what we talk about when we're talking about that type of equipment. Um, the ECG module. Um, I'm thinking of the ECG module that you plug into the monitor. It's not the ECG that you roll around the hospital and do the 12 leads with. And so for an example like the BF, that would be not the, um, the pulse ox itself. That would be the little finger probe that you would put on um, that puts out the little red light. We, we all know what it looks like. So this is just examples of how you would use the BF and the CF in different definitions. And this way you can get a grip of what they're going to talk about if you do see these in the future. As Jack was talking about 60601, it's, it's a medical safety standard. It's just like NSAP 99. It's designed to protect the patient, the caregiver, and us biomeds, because we do need protection also. Sometimes we actually need protection from ourselves. <laughs> um, and if you can see the date it was published, it would go, goes back to the date of when um, they started, first started talking about microshocks. And this is, this is when all the regulations started when, for the safety and, uh, for the patients and the public. Okay, some other things you're going to hear with 60601. It's going to be a single fault condition. And these will, you will show up again, like I said, later when we're talking about testing. Okay, um, when you're talking to another biomed, you're talking open ground. They use the term open earth. So if you, I know we all just sit home and read our service manuals and we barely have time to have a beer, but if you find yourself in a pub and you're talking to somebody from the UK and they're talking about their single fault conditions, and you're talking about your open ground, you're talking the same language. You can have a cheers. Okay, another thing you'll see when they start, we start talking about testing is the word applied parts. Uh, this is, indicates it's any type, piece of the medical equipment that comes in contact with the human patient. Uh, this, the first thing that ever comes to mind when I'm talking about this is ECG leads. So, when you're thinking of applied parts and you're having the, the pub beer, think ECG leads and applied parts. You have more common ground to talk to other biomeds. Okay, um, we're going to just briefly go over 62353. Um, I've heard of some major uh, manufacturers having their FSEs test this in the field, but this is mainly for design and manufacturing purposes. And this is, it's very similar to 60601, it's for safety, but this is how they'll design and um, <clears throat> manufacture medical equipment. So uh, if you go into design, you'll definitely see this. And if you, honestly, if you go into design, please don't put a thousand screws in it just because you can. You'll do us all a favor. And here's the one that we use in the United States, an SAP 99. Um, we're going to go through some different terminologies because depending on what generation you are, uh, where you got your training, how long ago you got your training, we all talk about some of the similar things, but we all talk about it in different terms. So we're just going to go over what the latest terms are, and this by no means is what your facility should do. Um, this is just what we're putting out, what the latest material is, and that you'll have knowledge of it. And from this, you can develop a basis of what your shop should do. 
you probably already got an SOP in place. So first of all, we're, we're going to talk about areas of classification. Um, this is not for determining of limits of what you should test to. This is for determining of risk assessment maintenance criteria. So uh, back in the olden days, not to date myself, go club this, <laughs> but uh, we, we had different designation areas and they had different limits. So, but in this, this for the NFAP, and, it's, and if you want to look it up, it's NFAP 1.3.4.1. It'll just go in there and talk about the risk uh, risk classification areas. First, we're going to have category one, and this is going to be it's going to cause death or major injury. Uh, when you're thinking OR, you're thinking big stuff like uh, the anesthesia machine, and then oh, of course, like Jack was talking about the ESU because you know that can lead to major burns, and major burns can lead to amputation. So this is for category one, you're thinking big major equipment. Category two, uh, we're going to think about a little more non-invasive equipment. Um, I usually think a more non-invasive uh, monitoring system. That, that's what I'm going to look for in category two because it minor injury the patient, but it might not. Because uh, you've all seen where you had the blood pressure cuff and it inflates too much. And it can actually bruise the patient, especially with the frail arm, if it over inflates. So this is where it can cause injury, and that's why we're talking about inpatient wounds. And that would be a category two. Category three, this is not likely to cause injury. Uh, you're going to see in this, you're going to see exam rooms and dental offices. Um, when I'm thinking about exam rooms, I'm thinking about otoscopes. Um, honestly, I've never heard of an otoscope hurting anybody, but um, if you have, it's probably a really funny story, so feel, feel free to email me about it because, you know, we all enjoy a good laugh. In Category 4, this is where no physical harm should happen. Um, they put on this the labs, but the, we're not talking at the quarter of the part of the lab that has the equipment. We're talking more about the blood draw rooms. Uh, you know, where the safety or it's just a gooseneck lamp and, and an exam chair. The one I, I find that's kind of funny on here is morgues. Um, if anybody's ever been scared to death by their co-worker in a morgue, they think the category should be a lot higher. And I'm in that case. My co-workers have scared me to death in the morgue, so um, I think there could be injury there. Okay, now we're going to talk about a little about classifications. Um, again, depending on your generation or, or where you got trained at, you have a different knowledge of classification. Right now, with NFAP 99, the only classification that they have is Class 2, and this is considered double insulated equipment. Um, back in the olden days, uh, it, we used, I used to think of stuff as Class 1 and Class 2, and I've, I've heard of um, patient areas being called different classes, as of also wet areas being called different classes. But as for the new 99, uh, NFAP 99, it's double insulated equipment. And this, uh, if you do have double insulated equipment, this is the only equipment, equipment that can be in the patient vicinity, uh, in the area of the patient. And this would fall under NFAP 99, 10.2.2.1.2. And this is where it'll say that you can have double insulated equipment near patients. Okay, some other terminology that we have to get used to. Uh, this is coincides a little bit with 60601. This is fixed equipment. Um, we commonly refer to this as hardwired, uh, at least where I come from and with my background. Um, and the only stipulation right now is it should be tested before it's hardwired in. I've actually seen some smaller devices where they'll actually go in and wire uh, an H-plug to it, test it, and then you can turn it over and let the electricians hardwire it into the wall. Um, and the, the only requirements on this is it should be less than 10 MA. Portable equipment. Okay, we all know about the equipment we see rolling down the hospital every day. We always think of that as portable equipment. 
but as you can see in the standard, it says if necessary. So this could also be a bedside monitor. You know, bedside monitors hardly ever um, move, but if you have one that fails and you have one you can't move the patient, you have to move the bedside monitor. And thank God for the new holding devices. It's so much easier to slide most of those monitors in and out and, and change them out. You don't have to do the whole wall mount. But this is what we're going to talk about when we're talking portable equipment. Now we're going to get into some testing. And this is where, again, depending on your generation and your where you got your education from, you're going to have some different testing things. Uh, first, we're going to talk about jack ground resistance. Jack touched on this. This is the resistance of the power cord. And so what you'll do is you'll plug one end of the power cord in, and then take the Calvin cable and plug it to the grounding pin of the equipment. Um, I asked an instructor recently uh, why we call it Calvin cable. Um, I've never found out, but that's what we've always called them. I even asked Google, and they just took me to the Rigel website to, you know, show me my safety. So um, if anybody knows why we call it Calvin, feel free to give us an email. That would be great feedback. In this picture, you'll be able to see where we, what I was talking about. You can see the power cord of the device to be tested, how it's circled around, and it's plugged into the back of the safety. And that's a little outlet. It'll look like the wall outlet. And then you can see the Calvin cable or the grounding cable that comes from the safety, and we connect it to the ground pin. And that's the, how the usual setup will be for uh, your ground resistance testing. Okay, if you're going to read in FAP 99, this is actually what it will look like while you're reading it. Uh, this is some actual verses from it. And if you can notice down towards the middle of the page, the one and the two, it starts talking about how when you're testing, you need to flex the cord. And we need to do this because we all know that nurses' favorite way to unplug anything is by pulling the cord. They don't know what the plug is. It, it seems to be a trait of the nurses. And so when you're testing this and you're flexing, if your readings start to change, even though it could be a molded plug, it could indicate that, you know, you do have damage within the plug. So this is where you'll want to start looking at replacing the plug or the whole cord itself. But you notice where it does tell you that you go ahead and to flex. This is just a little bit of quick, quick view. Uh, this is standards that we're going to test to. And you can see where the NFAP 99, it tests to 0.5 ohms. And then this is always where this is where we're going to start in talking about the comparisons of 60601 too, just in case so you will be familiar with it. And it does have a standard of 0.3. Um, zero readings are suspect. Uh, Jack touched on this a little bit. But uh, majorly uh, what we're what in the biomed field too, um, besides the, the other ground, um, if, you, if you can't, if the unit doesn't have a grounding pin on it and you're looking for another piece of metal, um, if you're getting a zero reading and your meter doesn't read open, because um, some managers out there don't show you the open condition, if you're reading zero, it might be an indication if you're not on the ground pin that you have a bad ground connection. So try another spot on the, on the piece of equipment. Okay, here we're going to go for touch current. Um, this has so many different terms, and traveling around the shops, I've heard everybody call it everything. And then again, it depends on where you come from and what you call it. Uh, for now, in, a, uh, in FAP 99, they've changed the, the term leakage current to touch current. And this is just so it'll be in more with IEC standards. So again, when you're in the pub drinking, you will know what touch current is. Uh, as Jack talked about touch current, um, he went over the basics of it. And yes, you, we've all heard the voltage doesn't kill you, it's amperage, and this is where it comes into play. Um, basically, in layman's terms, I was told a long time ago how to explain it to people that aren't biomeds. It's basically when you build up static electricity dragging your feet. This is what the unit would do if you were a unit. And then you touch somebody and you let the spark go. Uh, this is totally layman's terms, but it gives you an idea of how to think and how to be able to talk to people in terms that they might understand by relating it to something 
you know, that happens every day. So in this, when, where the leakage current comes and it tries to take the least path. And so that's why we're, they, they we're talking about uh, touch current. I know a lot of you out there, uh, there's a whole bunch of ways to, to measure and, and what, you, what you are measuring. But the four recommended ways to measure right now on NFAP 99 are only four. We'll do it on and off, uh, ground open and closed. And these are just the four conditions that we are going to test for uh, under NFAP 99. And as you look here, and this is where it will cite it, and, and it will show you the four test conditions. This is the actual NFAP 99. So you can, you can look and verify and then make sure that, you know, we're, we're reading it. Um, again, this is not telling you that this is what you should be doing in your shop. Uh, your shop SOP dictates what you should be doing. We're just telling you what the latest NFAP 99 says. And so this is standards go by. If, if you feel the free, you know, if you want to modify what you're you're doing currently. And here's some more standards. Um, right there where it says one and two, that's where you'll start talking about uh, what the standards are. Hold on. Um, and that's where you'll see wh where it'll it'll start talking about. Uh, what conditions you need to test under. If you go on down to where it says 10.3, that's where it's going to start talking about ECG leads and how we need to test them. And that's a big variance of how you test them. Um, we're going to show you what NFAP 99 says, but other people, you know, they have their own means of testing. So, again, don't run to your manager and tell them Becky said so. Uh, I'm not the god. I'm just a biomed that plays a god. You know how it goes. Uh, so, here is a quick view table of what we're going to look for when we're looking for the touch current. And so you can see where it's 100 microamps and 50 and 500 microamps. And when I, we were talking about 60601, this is where you're going to start seeing normal condition and single fault condition. So thinking back, now we know our, from our buddy the single fault conditions are we going to open the ground or open earth, as they would say. Okay, for portable equipment, um, lead leakage. This is where we're going to go turn back to where we have at it at 10.3.6.1. And this is going to start telling us about the, the how to test the leads. You can notice where it says now that all leads are combined together and tested to ground. Newer testers can do that. Um, and they do it automatically for you. You don't even have to think. You just press a button, like on the NFAP 90, uh, our Safe Test 99 that we just showed. Older testers, you can see where you can go in between the two uh, leads, and then you, if you turn the knob all the way around, usually on the older models, there's a uh, there's a setting that all to ground. So that would accomplish the same thing. Okay, here is a quick view of what you're going to be looking for when you're in your do this. Uh, of course, with the patient leads, we're going to look for the 100 microamps and the 500 microamps under the certain conditions. But if you look down at 60601, this is where the different types that we talked about come into play. So they'll have to do for B or CF or different applied parts. And so while they're doing all these other tests, we have a lot more free time. Well, of course, to do more PMs. <laughs> what else would we do? And here's another little quick view table. Um, this is what I was talking about on the, some of the older models that have the buttons that will test between leads. The NFAP 99, you currently do not have to test between the two leads. Um, again, this is just what the latest version says. Um, I know a lot of you out there, you're thinking troubleshooting, that's how you troubleshoot. What I would recommend for like the newer models is connect one lead at a time. If you connect one lead and then you connect the next lead and the, shoot, and, the, and the readings go way off, you know you have a bad lead. But also we always know that it, it's not just always one bad lead, we have more. 
So I would continue adding all the leads one at a time and testing it that way. That way you can do, do some troubleshooting if you suspect that you have some bad leads. And here we're going to go for our quick view test. And this is patient isolation test for leads. Um, currently, in FAP 99 doesn't require this. But again, 60601 does. So this is going to free up even more of our biomed time to do even more PMs. Aren't you guys happy? <laughs> so you can go through and uh, you can actually see uh, different standards. Again, like I was talking about, you can when you're talking to your colleague across the pond, you can see the CF, the BF, and different standards that they have to test it. Okay, currently uh, NFAP 99 has designated class two equipment. Um, and they no longer give uh, instructions on how to test for it. Uh, so when you do see class two equipment, it's going to be, it's going to have a little square like you, we just showed in 60601. And um, it's, what you're going to do is, since NFAP 99 no longer gives instructions, what I would say is you're going to be visually inspect it, and you're going to make sure that you see that it has the dot on it. I was also annotated on my work order because, you know, if Joint Commission comes in and they see that you're having no results, you want to, you want to denote that it's a double insulated piece of equipment. So th that's where you want to go with this. Okay, this is a good change that I think that's happened. Um, have you ever been on call in the middle of the night and the nurse has some patients going to sit because they want to use their computer and it doesn't have a safety sticker? Um, this is part of an FAP 99 change that came about that says all value personnel can be safety monitors, basically. But then again, if your shop SOP says that you biomeds are the ones that can put safety stickers on stuff, uh, you're going to have to get up and go to the hospital and go in at the 2 o'clock in the morning call. Here we're going to go for visual inspection. Um, one of the things is the housing, and then you have the decontamination. Uh, hopefully it's already came uh, from Central Sterile decontaminated. If not, I hope you have a good working relationship with Central Sterile so it can decontaminate for you. I, I know a lot of us uh, biomeds, we have no choice, but, you know, to blow up and clean the blood off and go through with our testing procedures. Um, when, when you're going down through them, one of them is uh, fuel rating. Um, and I don't know if you guys uh, have ever seen the memes that come through for the military. There's some different things that you can plug into the fuse socket holder, and the last one being the bullet. So that, that's always a good meme if you want to Google it. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the power cord. This is back to the basics. But this is the first line in the patient protection. Because without the power cord, we have no path, and then it all goes through the patient. So what you're going to do is, you, for the ground connector, you're going to have to look for broken or bent pins. Um, I would also look for pins that have been bent, bent back straight. Because even though they've been bent back, they can cause some problems. And also you want to look for discolored pins because that means something's arcing somewhere. So it might be the wall outlet and you'll have to get the, the building to come and check out the outlet. Or it could be something internal in the plug. So discolorations, you know, where it's, where it's been uh, arcing, that is never a good thing. Uh, and then back until the basics a little bit more, if you do determine that you have to replace the power cord, um, I, I know a lot of you have been out there in the field forever, and it's just second nature, but we were going to go over a little bit about uh, what, the, what the color codes are. Um, the U.S. has black, which, which is hot, white, which is neutral, and brown, which is green. Um, I know at Biomed we have lots of things, remember lots of things. Uh, everybody knows the ones about resistors. The one I learned for this one is uh, from the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, there's a line in there that says black gold Texas T. So I always know to take the black, pin, black wire to the gold pin and when I'm wearing an H plug. So uh, go home tonight and Netflix that and hopefully it'll stay in your mind of how to wire up a, a, an H plug when you, if you ever need to.
Okay, this is a major change that happened in test procedures. Um, it was in FAT 2012, and you can read, I've stated the paragraph on here. And previous uh, editions of NFAT, they went from six to 12 months, and it was stated in there. Right now, um, it's only the tested that you modify that you do it for service, and you do it the first time you do a repair. So uh, this is a big change. Um, this is something you're not going to run to your manager and say, oh, Becky says I'm not doing PMs again. <laughs> I don't need the email. I get enough of them. But just, I know there's a couple shops that actually, that actually do it this way. So this is just, in, it's part of the NFAT 99. So if you want to uh, do, do it this way, uh, this is part of the regulation. But by all means, go with what your shop SOP is, is talking about. Data management. Um, there's all types out there. Some people still use the pen and the paper and file it away. Some people are all electronic. Uh, we have one safety analyzer. You scan the barcode. It does the test. It automatically uploads it. So um, there's all kinds of out there. What, you, what you're going to do is you want to make sure that it's structured um, that you're doing the same thing for the same piece of equipment every time. You know, uh, what they say, uh, how is that always phrase? Say what you do and do what you say. You need to make sure that that happens. You're going to follow all the protocol calls. And, and for scheduling, this will be coming great also. So you'll know that, you know, some products you, you'll do every six months and some you'll do every, you know, 12 months. And just for a little bit closing ceremony, uh, we're going to do some recommended reading. And for you CPETs out there, like I am, uh, you know we're always trying to collect those renewal points. And this is some recommended reading for your renewal points. This is a little brochure that we give out. Uh, we can either give it out you a hard copy if you still like to fill a paper and you want to read, or we can send you a PDF of it. Um, I know it's, it's marked 62353. Uh, but this isn't just about that one. This is all the background, all the science, all the physics that go into safety testing. So this is, this is what you, you'll want to do uh, and, and read if you want to get all the background for all of it. I'd like to thank you all for your time today. And again, happy HTM week. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to 24-7 uh, for uh, questions and answering. Thank you. Hi, yes. Um, the first question, do people really die from failed safety? Um, I'll take this one. Uh, yes, it's a sad fact that people do die and have died from failed safety. Even though it seems like it's a simple test, people do die. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason that we have all these regulations about it and, and testing for it, to prevent, to prevent preventable deaths. One, um, you mentioned zero. I'm mean, questioning zero ohms for ground continuity test. Why? Well, I'll, I, this is Jack, and I'll take care of that one. Zero ohms is is kind of perfect, and we don't usually live in a, a real perfect world. Quite often, you'll see ground resistance of 0.1 something, maybe 0.2 something, but zero ohms. You know, Becky touched on it usually means that, that something's not right. And my experience with it is the electrical safety tester uses a 1K resistor to mimic the body when it measures the touch current or leakage current. And if there is a, another connection, think of maybe a, a treadmill with a, um, a heart monitor. Usually there's cabling going between the two. Those, those cables can introduce a secondary ground path. And current, as we spoke very early in the presentation, will take the path of least resistance. So if you have zero ground path or a 1K ohm path, it's going to go towards the, uh, the zero ohm path. And that's what you'll measure, which could be then an incorrect measurement. The safety analyzers that we manufacture, that will come up as a little warning, a secondary ground path warning. So it gives you the opportunity to uh, take a look at the machine 
If there is some interconnecting cabling, you can remove that and most likely get a more accurate ground reading. Wonderful. And here's one, another one submitted by um, the audience members. Can you speak to reverse polarity testing? Sure. I, I'll take that one as well. And that used to be part of um, NFPA 99 and early editions as well. It's been since removed. And part of the reason, um, I think, that it's been removed is when you're doing safety testing, especially with uh, more computerized equipment now, you want to limit as much as possible how many um, power cycles the piece of equipment can see. So, you know, if you're doing um, ultrasound, you want to perhaps limit how many times you turn off and turn on that piece of equipment. And doing reverse polarity testing would actually do that. It changes the hot and neutral lead and um, then cycles power to the machine. And I think over the course of time, there's been enough testing done where it's been documented that there's little, if any, difference between normal polarity and reverse polarity testing. So it's, um, it's been removed from, I think, the last two or three revisions of NFPA 99. And uh, just a heads up, there's a, a new revision in the works of that uh, test protocol as well. Thank you. And you mentioned microshock. What exactly is macroshock? Becky, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, well, microshock, you, you can tend to think of that to one specific area. Mac macroshock, you tend to think of it going across the whole body. So you, could, you tend to think of it as going in one arm across your chest and out the other. And then that's what the tendency to think of mac macro shock is. Thank you. And do any other governing agencies make policy on doing PM? Um, I'll take this one. Yes, there are a, a lot of policies um, put out there. Um, You'll see what we had for NFAP 99. You'll see Joint Commission. And then one that we don't really think of uh, is the one for uh, CMS. It's the one for Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. And they will put out, actually, even uh, policies on testing up for equipment for re the reimbursement for your hospital. Great. And um, another one from our audience members. How do you safely check? Actually, hold on one second. How do you – actually, let me do another one. Sorry about that. Um, if a ground pin is broken, where does the leakage current go? Um, to the cave or to the patient. <laughs> it's connected. <laughs> it, it'll, it's like what they'll, they talk about. It, it'll go through the path, path of least resistance. So it'll go uh, through the case, or if it's connected to a patient, it will go through the, the patient. And that, that's why the grounding pin is so important. It gives the it gives the, the path path of least resistance to go and get, exit the machine. Okay. And back to the original one. How do you safely check class two equipment with a two prong cord? You right again, now, Becky. Uh, <laughs> right now, like I discussed, NFAP 99 has no regulations for the two-pin cord, um, so we'll have to defer to your shop SOP on that one. But uh, like I said, um, I would definitely do the visual inspection and make sure it does have the, um, the in double insulated symbol so people around it will know that it is double insulated. Um, from there on, there, there's really no recommended standards on how to test the double insulated equipment since NFP 99 does not give instructions at the moment. Yeah, so this is Jack. I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, if there are any metal screws holding the casing together, you could take your, your Kelvin cable, your round probe, and just touch on those screws, the metallic screws, to see if you get any readings. Some manufacturers have gone as far as to take a, a piece of uh, copper foil and with an alligator clip, attach that to the Kelvin cable and then wipe um, around the case with that copper foil 
to see if they uh, they capture any leakage for it. So a couple little workarounds, but on um, again, if you follow NFPA 99 latest revision, it, it's not something that uh, they have you doing. Okay, with the trend toward a lower current value for ground continuity testing, wouldn't any film resistance on the contact service impact the measurement? I'll uh, I'll handle that one. And where I think where that that question is being derived from, in IEC 6601, uh, they did their ground continuity testing at a specified uh, current of 25 amps. Uh, 601 also had to do high pot testing at elevated uh, voltages, two times main voltage plus a thousand volts. The difference between 62353 and NFPA 99 is a little kinder and gentler approach once the uh, the product is in a facility, because there are plenty of, of tests that have shown that continued high current or high voltage testing starts to break down the uh, the dielectrics. So the key element is if there is a little bit of corrosion or resistance film, uh, we use what uh, <laughs> technically we call a zap circuit, which is, is a very high tech term. We have a, a capacitance in the unit, and when you first make your ground connection, we discharge that capacitor to that ground point. So if there's any conductive resistive film uh, sitting there, it kind of uh, burns through, if you will and uh, a solid ground reading is, is captured. Great. And um, does 606011 meet and exceed all of NFPA 99 standards? And if I purchase a new safety analyzer, which standard should I select? What would you select if you had the choice to set the policy for the hospital? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that's the kind of question you could ask uh, two people a.k.a. Becky and myself, and get like four different answers. Um, IEC 66... <laughs> I know, I'm going first. IEC 6601 is, is really the manufacturing test standard, and in some service manuals for, for some uh, medical products, you'll see them talk about 6601, as, as Becky mentioned. I think, though, um, for what the testing we do here, uh, North America... It's, again, mandated by many states that NFPA 99 is a test protocol, but, uh, you know, side note on that, the, uh, the rate and pace of some of our state legislature, uh, they might be talking about NFPA 99 dash, you know, 2002. But when you look at NFPA 99 test standards, they're very, very similar to 62353. I would choose something that had uh, NFPA 99 first most, and 62353, many safety analyzers, that kind of goes along with it. Um, but again, for here, North America, especially the states, NFPA 99 is, is the most common being utilized. Wonderful. Thanks, Jack. And one final question so that we all get out on time. Um, when testing ultrasound probe resistance, is dipping the probe and ground plug in saline the best way to test? The, there's been um, a couple of, of written articles that have been included in service manuals. Um, some people will say saline. Some people will say tap water. There could be more minerals in tap water to help uh, conductivity between the, the probe itself and ground. But typically the way that you do um, often test and the, the probes themselves is you do put them in a soak of a solution. And I'll, I'll go as far as to say a solution. And then look at um, a ground connector in that solution as well and, and measure leakage current from that perspective. Thank you, and excellent thank you so much. In order to finish on time today, I want to conclude by saying thank you to our presenters, both of whom did a wonderful job, as well as our audience members and our sponsor, Rigel Medical. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you may rewatch for free anytime in the next year using the same link you used to log on today. And feel free to share the link with colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Also, please email me at kstevens, and that's stevens with a ph, at MedCorp, 
which is medqor.com, with questions, comments, and future webinar suggestions. And please visit us at www.24x7mag.com. Thank you again for participating in 24 by 7 Magazine's webinar, Electrical Safety Testing, Plan Preventive Maintenance. Have a wonderful day. Bye.